That's Retro Fandango. That's Retro Fandango. When it's Android over iPhone, and you can keep your stupid amiibo and always bashing on Nintendo. But that's Retro Fandango. That's Retro Fandango. Thanks, Retro Fandango. Well, here we are. Look at us. Finally, ready to go. Woo! Yeah. One, of us, two, one of us. One of us was late. One of us. Oh uh, well. Welcome to Retro Fandango, episode number two thirty-three. Which one of us was late? We'll just let your imagination run wild. We'll leave it open. We'll make it mysterious, like a Ridley Scott movie. We won't exactly answer the question. Is Decker? Or you can check the comments. Is Decker a replicant? Who knows? He might be, or he might not be. But which one of us was late? Nobody knows. Might have been Richard. Might have been Rocket Sauce. One of them. Who knows? Who knows? I forgot my... I guess we'll never know. Oh, here it uh... is. So if you might recall the last episode, I teased the old Blade Runner HD DVD set. Yes. Five different versions of the film contained in this set uh so wait a minute you got um all right let me guess here i know i've read this before there's uh gosh i want to go with there's u.s theatrical yes that's one then there is international or european uh you're you're right the first time international international doing very well yes then uh, there was the is this like an anniversary edition. Mm, no, you're getting no, cold. no. Um, <laughs> Rocket Sauce says none of the five <laughs> are entertaining. <laughs> uh, I, I gotta admit, years ago, the first time I watched that, it was a rough watch. I didn't know what I was getting into. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, uh, you got me. I don't know. Okay, U.S. So- International, and then and what are the other nonsense edits? <laughs> okay, so. Uh, Yes, the U.S. theatrical cut. That was the cut that was in the movie theaters Mm -hmm. that everybody saw. And it was the the director's cut. I missed that. Right. Yeah, the director's cut. Okay. So U.S. theatrical cut. That was the one that was in the theaters. That was like the main. That's the one that the studio put the narration over. Right. Yeah. So so in this set, uh, if we'll go, we'll go chronologically. So the first. Technically, the first version of the film was the work print, which was thought was lost uh, okay. forever, right? But then it was found mm. in like 1990 or something like that. That is the version of the film that was shown to test audiences and was mm-hmm. sort of originally what Ridley Scott's version vision was for the film. And then, uh, you know, it didn't test very well. So that's where they had to go back. And that's where uh, they added the narration back into the Mm -hmm. film that Ridley Scott had cut because he thought it wasn't very good. But then the studio was like... From what I understand of it, he never wanted the narration. The studio pushed for it. Harrison Ford didn't want the narration, so he read it as if he was reading the back of a cereal box. Right, and that's why originally it was cut. So in the work print version, Mm -hmm. there is no narration because they both agreed that the narration wasn't working but the complaints they got back from people after when the film came out or for this work print version of the film was that it was too confusing so then the studio demanded that they put it back in because within that narration it, a lot of the story is explained right and right. so they're like well we need to explain so that's why it's controversial whether it you know mm. it, it, it should be in there or not it probably shouldn't be but anyway so then that was that was the cut that so that came out in the theaters with the narration. So there isn't too much of a difference between the work print version and the theatrical uh, cut. Those are the two. Uh, there was also more violence in uh, the original cut that was cut out for North American audiences. So right. then the international cut of the film is the narration's in and the violence is in. Uh, so okay, yes, right. yes, yes, yes. All right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that was the cut that was, you know, okay overseas, but it wasn't okay over here. Then in 1992, 
um they came out with this director's cut that sort of had a little bit of ridley scott's okay he wasn't fully mm-hmm. in on it he just said okay fine so that's where they put the violence back in for the dvd i think there was a bit of a theat like a theater limited release kind of thing for it mm-hmm. but then on the dvd the violence was added back in and the narration was cut and that was the cut that you could get on dvd for the longest time and on vhs that was it so we're up to four now right okay work, work print theatrical cut european cut director's cut 1992 so from like 1992 to 2007 that was the main cut of the film and then in 2007 uh ridley scott and warner brothers were arguing over you know who had the rights to the film and finally they figured it out they 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 came to some sort of agreement and then ridley scott went all in and did a recut of the film and that became the final cut <laughs> the final cut. the okay, final yes, cut that's what they called it yes all so right. the final cut of the film is now the definitive version of the film it has no narration in it some scenes are reworked to cut out some um uh, uh what indiscrepancies you know like uh, mm-hmm. editors mistakes or whatever and then uh at, he added lines of dialogue too to explain the story a little bit better hmm. and in the final cut because ridley scott has been very adamant that deckard is indeed a replicant right mm-hmm. that that's like the version of the story that he wanted to tell that was it so he made it more clear that it, he added like it's like a the unicorn dream sequence basically the book is based mm-hmm. on a philip k dick novel yeah. to Android's dream of electric sheep. And this is like him putting in there, like, you know, Deckard is dreaming, <laughs> you know, he's basically daydreaming mm-hmm. about a unicorn. And it's, uh, it is explained that that is a memory that is implanted in him, which is a dream, which is basically, it's somebody else's memory that's implanted into his brain, which specifically says that he is indeed a replicant. But if you go online, <laughs> there are a bunch of people there that just refuse to believe it <laughs> because they're just they like, just, oh. they just should have just had like a like a, a cord hanging out of his jeans or something. Like, oh, I got to recharge soon. <laughs> a pull back, a pull on the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like an old vacuum cleaner. Um, but unfortunately, though, on my HD DVD, uh, ver- the only versions that work are the final cut and the work print version. Really? All the ones in between, the disc is rotted and it won't work. Ooh. So I have to try to find like a Blu-ray version of it or something to watch those. That's a, that's really the one I want to see again is a theatrical cut with the voiceovers. Although I guess I could look it up on YouTube, right? I bet you they're on YouTube. Yeah, I, I watched a little bit of it. And boy, that narration is bad. The delivery. It is, just, yeah. It, it's... You, you can tell, absolutely, he was not happy to record that dialogue. Right. Well, when I was a kid, the, that was a version that I, I enjoyed. I enjoyed that movie. And then when the DVD version came out, the director's cut, I didn't, I didn't really care for that version because I didn't really understand what the heck was going on with the whole dream sequence and everything and the unicorn and all that. Yeah, then, I, was, um, I was a little thrown off for the movie the first time I saw it. I, I was in... Um... I was in university and one of my teachers, uh, she was going to show it to us uh, one day and she started by just ranting about how, you know, there's different versions of the movie and the only one you can get commercially, you know, easily is the one with the narration and she didn't want the one with the narration. I had no idea what she was talking about or going on about and then I think I fell asleep through the movie and <laughs> yeah. many years later, I'm starting to understand. Yeah um yeah i didn't like the director's cut because it didn't explain a lot like it just i I don't know i I never cared for it and then when i finally watched the final cut i was like okay now things are making sense in that and for me it's the type of movie that when you first watch it like i i didn't really care like i don't know i was kind of like sometimes i like it sometimes i didn't i don't know and then it just seems like the more you watch it the better it gets. It's like things well, kind of y- make sense and yeah, you know what I mean, to expect. And 
visually there's so much going on that if you just want eye candy and and some action you can get in there and get a lot out of it um understanding it is another level because it's it was made at a time when directors had a little bit of pull obviously he didn't have a hundred percent uh to make a film that was a little more challenging you just say like you know think about it you don't understand it come back and see it again you know um but now everything needs to be spelled out so clearly because money 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 it's all it's all about making yeah. that money for the well studio. i think that's why movies are so long too like i thought for some reason i've always thought that the different versions the runtime was extremely different but they're all around one hour and 55 minutes to two hours somewhere in between there there's really not that much variation in the runtime of any of any yeah of the well of they the film. they add scenes they take them away they still sometimes the studio wants that magic number. It's like we want it at this yeah. all right sure anyways i uh, i was re-watching it again just before we we recorded it and i was like yeah, i'm 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 digging it more now than i ever had before and you catching like more little things, more nuance and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I may have, I might've only seen it twice, like completely. Uh, and it, it's definitely growing on me a bit more. Rocket sauce is asking if we've seen the new blade runner, which yep. is now a few years old. And I, I still haven't, I almost watched it the other day, but uh, I did. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed that one too. I, yeah, I know. I, Sauce was complaining. <laughs> is that why you were late? You fell asleep? <laughs> that the movie is boring. I don't know. I don't. I, I just was talking to my buddy Frank about it, too, and he said the same thing. He didn't like how it is a slow, a bit of a slow burn. It's a slow movie. Yeah. And but I don't find it um, as bad as like 2001 A Space Odyssey, where it's just like watch this ship slowly. And I just that that to me is like a little too much. To me, there's just enough. There's enough going on in the film to make it interesting to me. I don't. I don't know. I don't find. How do it you feel slow. when? How do you feel when Scotty and Kirk are circling the Enterprise? Yeah, that no, that was bad. That's bad. There's no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's too much. It's too much. It just keeps going the, and going. I, I um I, I'm a bit more forgiving about it. I did hear one explanation, explanation, or just someone's input on it. Uh, a while back. That, By the way, we're talking about the motion picture, opinion. Star Trek, Star the, Trek motion. the motion picture, Star Trek, the Star Trek, the motion picture, <laughs> uh, where, of course, uh, in the beginning of the film, we're introduced to the crew and they, they board the Enterprise. And there's that long shot, uh, Scotty and Kirk in a little shuttle, and they, they go all the way around the Enterprise. And they're just looking at it from all the angles. And it just takes forever for them to go around this thing. But then late in the film, when they enter V'ger and, and you then see that ship doing the same thing, going all the way around V'ger and taking forever to get in there. Hmm. And you see the enterprise looks like this tiny little dot. Whereas in the beginning of the film, it was this huge, massive ship. You see just how large and grand scale the enterprise is. Yeah. And it's, it's just a tiny little dot compared to V'ger at the end of the film. Hmm. And it gives you that tremendous sense of scale. And the fact that it takes so long adds to the size and the weight of everything. So th there was definitely a reasoning behind it. Uh, viewers that are accustomed to, da -da 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 -da, you know, it, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a bit of a different feel. I always thought it was just because it was, they spent a lot of money on the model and like, like, Let's well, that get our too. Money I mean, the refit <laughs> is a beautiful ship. So yeah, and why not, yeah, why not well, have some of those shots? I I, I thought they were very uh, conscientious of how Star Trek was a TV show, and that whole sequence was like part of their doubling down on this is a movie, right? Yes, you've mm -hmm. seen the Enterprise on your little screen, but here it is on the big screen, big scale. Let's look at the thing, and I don't know. Maybe I think it's something down. that. You know, audiences in 19, like fans of Star Trek in 1979, going to the movie theater to see it would appreciate. But, you know, it, it, it didn't. It's just one of those things that didn't age well. Yeah. Uh, Plus, that movie had a lot of pacing issues, too. And again, the uh, director's edition or cut or whatever of that yep. uh, film is uh, helps it a lot. But they still stick to that long Fire shot of the Enterprise. Four 
dun, torpedoes. <laughs> I love that scene. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's it. That's Blade Runner talk. That's a science fiction talk. What else? Uh, just real about? quick. You did see the sequel? The yes, I did. I, I enjoyed it a lot. I only watched it once. I think I gave it three and a half stars on the old letterbox. Um, but if I watch it again, it might I might bump it up because I am going to follow up my rewatch of Blade Runner with a rewatch of 2049 and try to pick okay. up on. See, this is the other th- this is the other thing that people are uh not clear about because decker does show up in 2049 and he's an old man mm-hmm. so how can he yeah. be a replicant in the first film because they only have a lifespan of four years right oh hey don't say any more because i gotta watch it maybe i'll watch it today I, it's definitely worth a watch i i think anyways what else do we want to talk about? <laughs> I got stuff. Uh, I got toys. Oh, well, I got movies. I, we've been. We've yeah, been... yeah. You you hooked me with the title. I want to hear about toys in the attic. Okay, we'll do some. We'll do a little bit of toys here, and then we'll get to because uh, you you've been talking about video maybe, games. Maybe he found the outlet. <laughs> <laughs> Sauce is on fire today. Uh, uh, yeah, you've been wanting to talk about video games, so maybe we'll get to that after. I oh, okay, yeah, sure, things. I get it. Oh, so boy, I didn't bring my notes. If I can remember what they. Oh were. well, you know, whatever. If, okay, if you want. yeah, I, I, okay, I got them. I got them. I got them. Um, so as we know that I I got the toy collecting bug a little bit, if you will. Well, you got your your He Man's. I got the He Man's, and uh, I've been debating on whether to get more He Man, but they're. The ones that are not at Dollarama are, are rather expensive, so I, I don't know. I don't know if I, how far I'm going to go with that or whatever. We'll see. But uh, my buddy Frank came uh, over the other day. He wanted to go to Dollarama to get a. He's got like a display around his closet of these uh, miniature. It's like they're three point seven five inch uh, Marvel figures. And he had them. Okay. He had like a bunch of them lined up around his closet. And he just needed one more, so he found one at Wal- at Dollarama for five dollars. It was the thing, and uh, okay. I'm like, man, those are so cool. But I, I really, I can't, I can't get into this. I don't want to. I don't want to buy. I don't want to get into another toy. Forget that. Yeah. And then after he left for the day, I just kept thinking about it, thinking about it. <laughs> And I went back to Dollarama and I grabbed a bunch of these. Uh, I was going to say you went to your mommy and you begged her. <laughs> Frank has it. Can I have it too? <laughs> no, I told Sarah. I'm like, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I think I'm just going to go and get it. So I, I, I went there under the guise that I was getting chips because we were having nachos. And they do have mm-hmm. really good, like, uh, not too salty nacho chips there that you can use to make nachos. So I did. I did get those, but I also did go to the toy aisle. Mm-hmm. So these were five dollars. <laughs> How old are you again? Five dollars each. I am uh, pushing fifty. Believe it or not, <laughs> pushing pushing the big five zero. What happened uh, to our generation? Just a bunch of kids. I don't know. Oh, well, it's because we were marketed this stuff. That's that's uh, that's what uh, it was. That, that's very fair. We yes. are the first generation, the only generation, really, where. Mm-hmm. It was okay. The, the the American government said it was okay to market directly to kids. That's where you got your McDonald's, and that's where you got all these cartoons with with toy tie-ins. Because the previous generations, they couldn't market directly to kids. They could market to adults. Look at this toy. We think your kid would like this toy. You should buy this for. And it was up to the adults, right? But. Mm-hmm. Reagan went in there and said, no, that's okay. You can market directly to kids. And then as technology improved and kids were less and less subjected to commercials, so the toys and everything started to go away. So that's why kids yeah. today, they're not that big on toys. All right. Anyway. Yeah, Rocket Sauce has a good point there. And exactly. uh, when you were a kid, you didn't get all of them. That's you know, true. You were too. always missing something. Yeah. Yeah. Now as an adult, you can uh, say, ha, ha. I'm going out for nachos. Well, 
and <laughs> Fantastic Four figures. Well, I was always jealous of the kids that got toys like all the time. I got toys twice a year. I got toys. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I got toys. If if I if I graduated, I would get one toy, like one mm -hmm. action figure, and then Christmas. That was it. So would you get stiffed on your birthday? My birthday was well, it's December. Very close to Christmas. My birthday right. was December twelfth, and I always got something practical for my birthday. I never got toys on my birthday. Now I'm not mm -hmm. going to say my parents didn't buy me toys on Christmas. Like I, I got, I had a lot of He Man. And uh, some mask and uh, uh, the real Ghostbusters. You know, those were the three mm -hmm. phases that I I had gone through. But um, yeah, I I didn't get them all the time. Like other like other kids would just show up at school and like, oh yeah, we went to uh, Consumer Reports the other day, or not? What was it? The uh, ah, remember that store? I don't know if you had it in. Well, you're talking about consumers, yeah? Where consumers, you look through the book? It. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, go yeah. in the catalog and say, I want, yeah, my parents just stopped in at Consumers and got this for me. And I, I had never even went into the store, <laughs> not let alone but got a toy from there. I, I never, even, I had never been in there. As exciting as it is to go to like a Toys R Us and see all the stuff, you know, on the shelf and how cool that looks with the display and the, the graphics and all that, there was something really fun about looking through the book. Yeah, and I found that store fascinating because you walk in, it's just a counter, and they yep. they got a couple of these manuals, and then uh, you say, "I want this." Someone yeah. goes into the back room, and then, whoa, there it is! It's well, like going to Santa's workshop, just just magic. Well, that's what that's what grocery shopping used to be before they came up with the supermarket thing. You used to go in and say, "Okay, get me five apples. Give me get, here's my shopping list," and they would go and get mm -hmm. it all for you. All right, toys. Here we go. Good audio here. For, so uh, so these are the Marvel. So they're like the retro Marvel Legends. Oh, OK. Kind of so they're like little little guys here, right? These are oh, these are bigger than I, I thought. I thought they were like little like unmoving miniature kind of three point seven five inches. So they do have some points okay. of articulation, but not a crazy. Amount. So this is uh, how much were these? These were five dollars. OK, so this is uh, symbiote uh, Spider-Man, the black suit. Yeah. Got I, I gotta say, I do like these toys better than the the things I always see in the store now, where they're forty five dollars and you know, really size of too much. They're detail. really tall and well, yeah. yeah I mean, detail is fine, but like a little toy that you want to put on your shelf, something like that, absolutely. Well, I just, I just think these they just look so cool. So we got Thor here yeah. with his with his hammer. Okay, and they're based off comics, not yeah. the movie. Yeah, like the original. It's a retro. All right, thing, yeah, right? that that that's. I enjoy that. Much. This one's really cool. The Green Goblin, with his mm. uh, sled. That's cool. Uh, I got uh, the Dark Phoenix. Oh boy, they they they're really going in all directions on these things. Well, if you look, how at many the of list, them are there? Um, I think there's about fifty of them. I think. Oh boy. And At they five go, bucks a pop. Yeah, <laughs> that's cheap though. They they regularly go for eighteen dollars, eighteen or nineteen dollars here in Canada. I think they're ten to twelve dollars in in the states. Uh, this one I really like too. The Black Widow here with her crossbow. Oh, I've got uh, a comment about Black Widow later. Okay. Did you? You mean did you see the movie? No. Okay. Good. Uh, I've got the thing here. This is what my this is what my buddy Frank picked up was the thing. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed the other one. This is nice because they're all to scale with each other. You know, when you get them in a, a big series like that. Uh, yeah, somewhat. Or, like, he's thicker, well, I, but I yeah, don't think he's right. not taller, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. I uh, got uh, Reed Richards, Mister Fantastic. With no, no stretchy action. No. And that was it. No, one more. Black Panther. Did I show this one? Nope. That's it. So I got I got eight of them. Neat. So tomorrow, that was just the uh, Dollarama here in town. So tomorrow, Saturday, Sarah and I plan to go to some <laughs> Dollarama. So one more sleep until I get more Marvel Legends toys. More toys. That's right. One more sleep. Uh, are you going to pin them around your closet too? Well, I have a bunch of room up here on top of the computer. So I might do your thing and, and put the shelves there and put them on shelves. 
or just like tack them on the wall. I'm not sure. Why don't you rip them, rip them open and they'll take up less space. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. We'll see. Mm. We'll see. I'm not sure. I don't know if I can leave packaged items around. That's why when I buy stuff, I always buy small things. Speaking of which, uh, if I can yes. jump on your toy segment. Sure thing. Uh, I have in the past mentioned those little uh, mystery egg things. Yes. You go, you put the coins in. And you... I showed off some Back to the Future stuff, some Gremlin stuff, some, uh, some really neat Batmobiles uh, that came out. Well, Back to the Future seems to be a very popular uh, IP for those things. Uh, and they put out a series of little DeLoreans, you know, like from a, from a first movie, second movie, third movie. You mean I, Time Machine? Mm. Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> I do make that mistake quite often. Uh, the Time Vehicle, Doc Brown's Time okay. Vehicle. Okay, all right. Uh, and I, I said, uh, you know what? I'm going to pass because a little while ago I bought model kits of those right and i have them from the the three films and i do have a little like hot wheels size uh time vehicle so i was like uh you know it's getting repetitive i don't know if i'm gonna go in on that but whenever i was in the vicinity and i stopped by and look at it i was like that's eh, still kind of neat that's eh, still kind of neat and i realized that i was walking by it one day and i pointed out to my wife wow there's there's not too many of those left Mm -mm. So she's like, are you finally going to just go ahead and buy them? <laughs> like, well, there's only it looks like there's only five or six in there and there's four versions. So the odds of my getting all of four of them, it's kind of slim. And then I'm going to have to run around and see if I can find the others. It'll kill me. So I'm like, no, I'm going to pass. So I didn't buy them. Earlier this week, Valentine's Day rolled around. My wife hands me a bag with a bunch of little eggs in it. <laughs> she went She went back to that machine without telling me. That's a good woman. There are four in the set. Mm -hmm. She she turned that crank four times, four times only. She got me uh, the first one that comes nice. with a little hook. Wow. So these are a little smaller than Hot Wheels, and they feel a little lighter, kind of yeah. plasticky, but they look nice. Uh, it's got the little hook. Uh, on the top there and uh it comes with again great audio uh it comes with little fire <laughs> effects the little sure. trails <laughs> it comes awesome. with four of them so you can put them behind the the car and make it look like it's you know speeding away nice the, uh you got the it's the body sorry. die cast or is, or is it plastic no it's plastic okay it's plastic they look good, but yeah, they feel you, they feel a little cheap. There was even a little sticker for putting the um, the license plate on. Right. We call them uh, decals in the business. Decals, yeah. yes. Um, you got the part two version with the Mister Fusion on yeah. the back. Nice. This one also came with a tiny, tiny, tiny hoverboard, <laughs> which also required a decal to uh, put on there. There's also the parts to hover version. That nice. Comes on a little, little thing there. And this is what, what I was really after because all of the time vehicles that I have, I don't have a hover version. So mm. I wanted that. And then, of course, the part three with the circuit board on top and the white wall tires. Wow. So she got all four different versions. She played it four times and she said just boom, 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 boom. She got... The four variants right there. Send Process her back system. four more. Well, <laughs> Sauce, being a smart guy, one of the reasons why I suddenly had a reinterest in this is because this was Series 1. Since this has been out, they have released a Series 2, which, again, I was like, I'm not going to go for that. But because she got me these, now I have to. Series 2 is mostly a reissue. You get the same uh, vehicle from Part 1 with the hook and the fire, but it also comes with this effect that you put on the front of the car that makes the vehicle look like it's entering oh. uh, time travel mode with the sparks. Nice. And there's a little, a little clear plastic Marty with the camera that you can put here. <laughs> then there's another version one where it's the vehicle 
after it's come back and it's covered with ice nice. and there's a little Einstein. Then there is another hover version and it has the little flag trail from the end of part two. Okay. And and there's a little sign that comes with it. So they, they're really selling you on like a lot of the little extra bits that come with it. Right. But the one I really need from there is the part three version where it has the train wheels and it has a little track. Yeah. So, I will be, I have already gone to search these out and the one place I knew that had it no longer has it. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of going all over the place looking to see if I can find these. The good news is that right in my area in, on March 1st, there is a new location opening where they just have those machines and they have like hundreds of them. So I will be uh, searching around with all the little uh, teenagers and uh, little children, <laughs> just like chicka, 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 chicka. yeah. Those vending machines are huge there, eh? Like they're huge, in. and again, the detail's really nice. But oh boy, they're constantly coming out with stuff. Luckily, out of hundreds and hundreds of machines, I usually only find one or two things that are actually interesting to me, because it's a lot of like anime characters or you know little kid things they have weird stuff there's like a dentist chair in one of them where you you just get like a chair and you get the swing arm with the light and it's like wow they make okay. everything into these whatever floats your boat i guess hey i don't know I, well what floats my boat are time vehicles we got the uh, deke here as well Hello, hey deke. hey all right uh, what do we want to do next? Did you want to talk about the, the video games? Or, or you sure. Bit? You got your notes? Oh, this is going back a little bit, though, because these are notes I've had for a while. Because I know this first game I played, oh, gosh, it was back in December. Like, I, it, it was, no, it was early December because I started playing it at the tail end of my, my COVID sickness, which mm. was in early December. Uh, I finally played that uh, that Ninja Turtle beat them up the uh the shredder's revenge yeah i picked that up a while ago when the um when the the extra content what do you call it? the dlc, DLC? came out mm -hmm. yeah so it was on sale back then and i picked it up and i was like ah, i'm gonna play that someday and uh, i was sick and i didn't feel like doing anything but towards the end you just feel like ah, i'm back to normal but i still have to stay isolated so i'll play some video games so i played through that game and it was good it, it was uh well designed uh, lots of great additions to the gameplay to make a beat em up a little bit more interesting for for, for modern day audiences uh little collectibles and things and in fact i liked it so much that i i, I hesitate to uh, go over all my little nitpicks about it because there are a couple things that bothered me uh but it was it was a uh, it was a fun playthrough. I, I want to hear your nitpicks now because I oh well, it. if you I, twist I, my arm there, Kev, I guess I could try to. Remember <laughs> I thought it them. was great. <laughs> no, the, yeah, it is a really good game. In fact, I played through it uh, four times. Oh wow, four turtles! So I, I actually I wanted to experience uh, all the different turtle playstyles mm -hmm. uh, because that's my first nitpick. Is there's a um, you know they they did a little thing in all the previous turtle games. They're all it's the same. It doesn't matter who you pick. You know, you just got the same. It's a palette swap, basically. So you can just be your favorite turtle. But in this game, they gave them a little ranking, like uh, speed, power, and, and something else, whatever. So I, of course, picked my favorite turtle, Donatello. And I was a little sad to find out that he was the slowest turtle. Which, it's not really that slow. It's not a big difference. But in beat-em-ups, I never liked the big, slow character. Um, I, I just... I prefer a little bit more smoothness, a little more flow. And like I say, he's not that slow and it doesn't really matter like how fast you get across the screen. But um, I guess they, they did give him more of a reach, which makes sense. He had that in that first yep. Nintendo game where, yep. you know, the, the bow staff can hit enemies from a little further. And I didn't really care for his taunt or victory animations. You have a little taunt that you do, and Donatello, they have him, like, hide in the corner and, like, play a Game Boy. Oh, right. 
<laughs> it's like the other turtle is like Leonardo. He's like, you know, stretching with his swords. Uh, you know, I think Raphael laughs at somebody or something. It felt like, okay, that's their character. Donatello hides in the corner and plays a Game Boy. Like he's an introvert. He he's an introvert, <laughs> but I fear like have him like mess with some technology or something, not yeah, play like, a Game Boy. You know, that yeah. that never seemed to be it. And then when you beat a level you know like Raphael gets a slice of pizza michelangelo's like doing that dance from the the intro of the cartoon and donatello's bow staff becomes a pogo stick and he starts jumping up and down and it's just like they make him look like he's five years old you know <laughs> i don't know it just didn't rub me in the right way. I, I am relieved to hear that these are indeed nitpicks. <laughs> they are nitpicks. And in fact, the only other nitpick I can come up with that I remember is um, the music was really good. So the music had a lot of uh, classic tunes from the older games that were kind of like... Um, maybe they refreshed them a little bit. They, they kind of... Uh, yeah. what, what do you call it when you change a song? Re not re remaster update remaster or, update whatever they kind of remix it remix remix that's what remix for. that's the word I'm looking for yeah and the best example is the music that plays when you fight Krang they took some of the old music from the the original arcade game and it just like they remixed it really well it just felt good other times they created new songs uh, but they tried to make them of the time like there's a one level where you're surfing through the sky and there's like yeah. this hair metal band that sounds like very 80s early 90s yeah uh the only one that absolutely was terrible is when you finally get to fight shredder and you get this weird gangster rap song that starts playing mm. i don't know I don't if you really remember recall. it but no I, I don't mind like them throwing in new music for this. I understand there's more levels. You got to create stuff. But everything else that they added felt like it was of the time because there's this big retro feel to the game. Everything, you know, there's tons of nods to the cartoon show where they're collecting VHS tapes and things like that. There's CRTs yeah. in the game. But then you get this song that sounds like it's from the early 2000s instead of being like a 1990 mm. like the um the rap song at the end of the movie the t-u-r-t-l-e power would have been much more appropriate because that was like a 90s feel to it i don't know i, I am not a hip-hop expert so i really cannot place I thought they had gangster know. rap in the early 90s, but maybe they didn't. I don't know. Well, they might have, but not for a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. Sure. Well, they should have had that Vanilla Ice song. Go yeah, on, like if they Ninja. had something that sounded more like Run DMC or Kid and Play. Or, right, right. You know, um, uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, mm -hmm. you know, that that of the time would have sounded better. I don't know. But the game was super fun. Uh, the only, I didn't really care for the final incarnation of Shredder, the Super Shredder, with the shooting fire and everything. Oh, okay. Eh, I was, it was all right, but uh, it was a good game. Yeah, I, I liked, uh, you know, following, like, collecting the pieces of Krang. <laughs> or, you know, chasing down a, the little individual parts of Krang until you actually yeah, yeah 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 i thought that was fun and then i i did like catch just parts of previous turtle games like turtles in time and what's the genesis one um uh the hyperstone heist Hyper, like just little bits from those games kind of in uh in this game but it was it didn't feel like as if i was just doing the same thing again you know like they kind right of just, like, they, they took they took what worked from the games and just kind of took the best parts and yeah. put them together. Like you have the overworld driving yeah. the turtle van around. Yeah. Uh, like from the first game, but it's, you know, uh, some, somewhat cosmetic. Just, you know, picking your level doesn't really matter because you still have to go. But at least you can go back and replay levels. Yes. If yeah. you want to find secrets or earn points. They give you a bunch of characters. I played through the turtles, but I haven't tried... Uh, 
Casey Jones or April or uh, they give you a couple other characters in the DLC. Yeah, I play. I th- someday I'll go back to it. I just played it once. Uh, I think I think Frank was over. We played like I don't know if I made it. We made it all the way through, but I played. Uh, yeah, it's Leonardo, and then he was he was Casey Jones. So I'm not sure if I. Oh, that was my other nitpick. That was What's my that? other nitpick, and I don't know if they're doing this intentionally, but um, uh, I I didn't play as Casey Jones, but I clicked on him just so that he would say something because I was listening to all the voices because they got the original turtle voice actors yeah. back for, for a lot of this who eh, sometimes it works. Sometimes they just sound like old people and it doesn't really sound like the way they used to. Uh, but Casey Jones, I think when you click on him, he's something like, uh, Whoa, let's go fight some foot soldiers, dude, or something <laughs> like that. Okay. And it's like they, they never get Casey Jones, right anymore i don't know are they not allowed to make him this menacing brute that he was in the comic and then even in the original cartoon yeah and then in the for that live action movie they had him be a little bit more intimidating it seems like every time they put casey jones in something now he's got to be goofy and silly or you know Less intimidating, less cool, essentially. I don't really remember Casey Jones from the cartoon, the original cartoon. And the, the cartoon was great because he never took his mask off. And he talked like this. Mm. We're going to go bash some butts. Yeah, he was like a... Was Clint, even, now it's coming back to me. He, was like he did Eastwood. like a Clint Eastwood. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was yeah. one episode, I remember, he, he got a job in an office. I think he was working undercover. So he still wore his mask, but he just wore a necktie and went to the <laughs> office to do his work. That's funny. Where do you want these files? Oh, I, I, I'm kind of remembering that now. Yeah. I I thought like it was because, you know, I haven't thought about the cartoon in like, I don't know, 20, 30 years. And then to see like the boss from the TV station, I'm like, I forgot about that guy. And. Irma. Yeah, yeah. I totally forgot about her. You know, the ones I I didn't know were so big was the um, the frogs. Or yeah, I, the, that must be like mutant, must have been later on, mutant right? Frogs or whatever. Yeah. yeah, like I I don't have a strong memory of them. Nah, me neither. I don't know who they are. Um, but like the Triceratons were were uh, well, they were in some of the older games too. There's probably some turtle experts out there that can. Fill in all the gaps. Oh, yeah. There's one character I wasn't sure. Was she actually in the show? The um, When you're in the arcade and the it's like the, the arcade hmm, character. I don't even know her name. Tem, yeah. Tem something. I have no idea. She comes out and she creates the the Toka and Razar from the movies. So they, right. they really tried to incorporate a lot of stuff. But I, I didn't remember that character. Meaning there were there were so many episodes of that show that they must have had, you know, the the villain of the week. Right. Sometimes they were just fighting gangsters and stuff. Yeah. Like Batman. Yeah. Correct. We're going to be talking there's about my Bat- little seg- there's my get segue to, to Batman. I do have. Yeah, well, I, I do not later. have my uh, comments yet. I mentioned last time I was watching the animated series. I'm still on the first season. I got like uh, four or five episodes to go. Uh, but I will come back to talk to it later on because I will try to highlight some of my favorites. Uh, and I'm not sure if I'm going to go into the Batman and Robin and the season three stuff. Mm. But there there aren't as many of those. So maybe. I don't know. To be continued. Okay. I do have some stuff to say about Batman and Robin. I go ahead. Think. Say something about the Batman. Well, do do we want to get into movie movie talk? Because it's the last movie I have mm. to talk about. So should we... Oh, yeah. Oh, actually. Yeah, okay. Whenever you're ready. Go. All right. Well, um, <clears throat> been doing the uh, not-so-special podcast, ABC, ABC Challenge. ABC Challenge. Right. Going for a full... Trying my best to get as many HD DVD movies in as I watch movies from A to Z with a, mm-hmm. with a number. I don't know if I'll are be you able going to... in order? No, no, I'm I'm jumping around. Bouncing around. Okay, like going in order as much as I can. But for instance, I didn't have a D movie, mm-hmm. so you know I had to. If I want to carry on, I had to go. Now I I we I put the challenge on pause for a bit as Sarah and I 
uh, every year we watch the Oscar nominated movies. So that's uh, ah, okay. Mm -hmm. But I still do have a few movies here that uh, I did watch for the challenge. So uh, I got, uh, we'll start with the movies that I showed the last time and I had not watched yet. These are the ones that I had watched from what I showed the last time. So first is uh, The River with Mel Gibson and Sissy Spacek. I've never heard of this. Uh, it's directed by, uh, what's his name? Mark Rydell, uh, who did, I can't remember what he did. Anyways, it's a bit of a um, Americana piece where it's like, um, uh, you know, they're, they're farmers in the uh, 1980s, uh, you know, trying to work the fields and all that. And uh, somebody wants to come in and build a power dam. Um, Scott Glenn actually wants to come in and build a power dam. And mm -hmm. uh, if he builds this power dam, it's going to flood all the farmland kind of thing. So, you know, the, these it's like Little House in the Prairies in the 1980s, pretty much. Okay. It's not it's not bad. It's OK. It's just kind of a little bit. I, I don't know. It's just one of those movies that's just kind of. Yeah, it's, it's just not much to it. Uh, did Mel Gibson, did SpaceX use her carry powers to, to stop the guy from she, building the dam? Somehow she did not have any sort of kind of supernatural powers. Uh, yeah. Mel Gibson's really miscast in the film. Like he just doesn't feel like, like he's this character. American. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't feel like. <laughs> but uh, one thing we did uh, note is that Scott Glenn, we were looking at, it's like, Sarah's like, he really needs a haircut because he wears his hair over his over his ears all the mm -hmm. time. And I'm like, I bet you that guy has like really big ears and he's self-conscious about it. And that's why he wears the hair over the ears. And when you put on a cowboy hat or something like that, you could kind of see. Uh, as I'm showing on the back of the case here, that he does kind of have some big ears. So next hmm. time you're watching a Scott a movie with Scott Glenn in it, just take a take a note of how big those ears are and why he puts the hair over it. Um, there's one memorable scene in this movie though. It's kind of out of place. It's almost like out of a Stephen King novel, where Sissy Spacek is. Um, everybody's left the farm. They're gone on some auction or something like that. They're poor. They're constantly selling their stuff or whatever. And so she's working on uh, this piece of farm equipment and she's underneath the piece. It's like a big you know, piece of farm equipment that's on wheels. She's underneath. She's trying to fix this chain and her arm gets caught like in the in the chain and it gets caught in a gear and it gets pinched and it like cuts her arm. So she starts she starts bleeding. Right. And there's all this blood coming uh, out from her. And she's like trying to call somebody to come help. She's, she's out in the in the, the cornfield. So the corn's really high. Nobody can see her. So she's trying to call it. There's nobody can. Some guys come to deliver some uh, seed, you know, and she's yelling to them and they can't hear her. So they just drop the seed off and, and take off. And then eventually uh, the, the bull on the farm finds her. Like he just mm -hmm. walks up to her. And so then she proceeds to uh, make the bull mad. So he'll hit mm. the piece of farm equipment. And eventually she, you know, gets her arm out of there. But that was like a really tense scene. It just felt like, like Alfred Hitchcock or something like that. It was just weird that this piece of banal <laughs> crap <laughs> had this like really one intense scene in it. It was just so weird. Maybe that's but, what sold the whole movie. Maybe. I don't know. But anyways, I, I can't recommend the river. Uh, here's another movie I can't recommend. The good shepherd starring Bobby D also known as Robert De Niro and you got your Matt Damon Shepard. and mm -hmm. uh, your Angelina Jolie. This was actually okay. directed by Robert De Niro. There's only really? two movies Robert De Niro directed. He directed this, this and Gino. one and uh, Bronx Tale. That's right. That is correct. Those are the only two films that he has ever directed. There's actually a lot of good ideas in this movie. Um, it's about uh, Matt Damon is like a, um, uh, he becomes a uh, he falls into like this uh, society and then he gets like in uh, he gets put into the CIA and, you know, his loyalties are constantly uh, tested. Um, oh, and this is an extra 16 minutes of deleted scenes. Oh, no, no. I don't watch the original version. Never mind. Anyways, 
it's just really long. It was just the, like him, Matt Damon and Angelia Jolie have like the same argument, like three times in the movie, how he doesn't pay attention to her and all that. She plays his wife, you know, and she's like, you don't, you don't pay atten- enough attention to me. You don't pay enough attention. To me. And it's just same thing over and over again, you know, kind of thing. But there were some good plot twists in it and that, you know, like it's one of those movies that I wish I could just go in and re-edit and, and, you know, trim it down to a good solid two hours instead of uh what is it three it's it's almost three hours long mm. and it's one of those movies that just does not need to be three hours long but it was a g movie so needed to cross the g off the list speaking of movies i can't recommend that <laughs> <laughs> seems to be a running theme i also watched uh the last samurai with tom foos Oh, okay. That's yeah. I need an L too. I've never seen that. I I can't recommend this one. I didn't really care for it. So it's um, it takes place uh, at the turn of the last century, uh, or actually before that, like just after the Civil War. Uh, the Japanese emperor wanted to bring Japan into the Industrial uh, Revolution, so he actually hires uh, some Civil War generals or high rank officers civil war officers to come and train his army to be more uh like a modern army for the late 1800s uh so it's based on like it's a little bit based on a true events but uh, and uh tom cruise is he, he was this officer who had partaken in uh you know the annihilation of the american indian he was involved in a lot of that stuff and he's carrying a lot of the guilt and stuff like that so when he comes to Japan to train these officers, one of their first uh, missions is to go in and get rid of the samurai warriors that are in Japan, because apparently the emperor wanted to move the country forward and the samurai had a lot of power, but they were stuck in the mm. old ways and he just wanted to go in and eliminate them. So his idea was that he was going to go in with all this modern technology and just shoot up the samurai. I, I, if I go any further, I'm going to ruin the ending. So I, I don't know if you want me to, but uh, I think I can kind of piece together where it's going. I, I can kind of see where his loyalty is going to lie. Right. So he's got, he's got uh-huh. a lot of guilt about the American Indian. He goes uh-huh. in there. He's like, he, he falls into, he gets captured by the samurai and then they uh-huh. kind of like influence him and all that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So then he goes and, he is he, he goes into this army and they're like, okay, you're the you know how these guys are gonna fight with all the guns and all that. And it's pretty much like, yeah, they're gonna kill us. So we might as well just go in and uh do our best and get killed. And they go in, everybody gets shot. And it's like, did they really need Tom Cruise to help them out? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they could have figured out how to get shot on their own. Uh, I don't know. So wasn't really yeah, he he does become one of the last of them. I don't know if he becomes the last of them. Well, that that's the uh, the thing is samurai is not pluralized. So, for rather it is plural on its own. Oh, I see. So I see. It refers to the entire group they of all, them. Oh, okay, out there. gotcha. Right. The only thing I, I really remember about uh, the last samurai is uh, Paul Mooney on uh, an episode of uh, the Chappelle Show going okay. off about. Uh, you know, Tom Cruise is the last samurai. Brad Pitt is the Mexican. And then he uh, mentioned uh, Tom Hanks would be in a film that I cannot name. Uh, <laughs> it was a very funny bit. <laughs> yeah, there's, I don't know. It is, it is based, it, it, you know, on, on sort of true It's events, based but... on historical facts. And it is a film made in America for primarily American audiences. So. Right. But it's it's, it's very like, loosely based on fact. Like there wasn't very a guy loosely, of course. It's, who went it's, it's over there a and, movie. Yeah, and, be, and, and joined the samurai, right? They all partake, <laughs> took in annihilating the samurai. There wasn't, but I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Americans can't watch a movie about foreigners. They have to watch, they have to, they can see foreigners in a film, but they, they need like a Tom Cruise. Uh, anyway that's yeah and you know what that's that's not a a very far-fetched idea like if you if you watch a film that's made in japan by a japanese production company it's going to star japanese people right you know yeah (laughs) even if they make a film there's so many uh uh the anime 
that's made it you know can take place anywhere in the world the way they draw characters and stuff you have no idea where it is and hey they're voiced by japanese actors because it's japanese production yeah like like you can't get upset over everything yeah and and a lot of times it's done very effectively you know like lawrence of arabia is you know or i can't think of another movie right now but it just with this movie it just it didn't make any sense. Like, what was the uh, point? Tom of it? Cruise movie. It's. I mean, it's, look I, at Tom Cruise. Isn't he cool? I, I bet I, he did his own stuff. Well, and that's the other thing too. Like, <laughs> he he he's supposed to be tough in here. He's like a, a mean drunk at the beginning of the movie, and every time it's just like, shut up, Tom Cruise. You're not. <laughs> you're not tough at all. You know. And then the funny thing was too is that he uh, actually dons on uh, one of the samurai ha have passed away in the film and he dons on his uniform and it's a perfect fit. And I'm like, Oh, mm. that's he, of course he fits in literally over there. Okay. Mm. Speaking of bad movies, uh, this one, well, this that, is, that seems to be all you're speaking of. This one can be pluralized and it is, it's called mobsters. Mobsters. What you is got this? the you got Christian Slater. Patrick Dempsey, mm -hmm. Richard Grieco, and Costas Mandalore. I don't know uh, this movie. I I didn't know about it either. I totally forgot about it. Uh, it also has Anthony Quinn in it and F. Murray Abraham and a very young Laura Flynn Boyle in it. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually based on some very fascinating piece of uh, organized crime lore. In in America, uh, there is what is known as the five families in New York that all run all of the organized crime in New York. And it was started by uh, Lucky Luciano. He's the one that brought all the five families together and uh, and got the organized crime all fixed up. But there was like a bit of a bloody war. Even Al Capone was involved in it, even though he was all the way in Chicago. Uh, it's it's. They're going to make a good movie about it uh, at some point. This isn't it, <laughs> mostly because uh, actually the uh, what's his name uh, Richard Grieco is actually pretty good in it. Uh, he plays Bugsy Seagal, and if he they moved him over to the lead, it might have worked a little bit better. But Christian Slater just is not the type of actor that could pull off this role. He's playing Lucky Luciano in the movie, and he's supposed to be this big tough guy that gets everybody together and all that, and I don't know. It just, he's trying to punch above his weight a little too much in the film. And uh, I don't know. I didn't really, didn't really care for it. Uh, it's too bad because the source material is there. There's a good movie in that source material somewhere, but they didn't pull it off with this one. Christian Slater should go back to being an officer on the Excelsior. He was really good in that role. That, that was fun. That was fun to see him pop up in that. Uh, speaking of movies that are okay. Not great, but okay. Uh, we have uh, Kate we're going Hudson. up <laughs> Kate something Hudson that's okay now in uh, the skeleton key, which is basically a uh, PG 13 type of horror film. Uh, Ooh, spooky thing, yeah, yeah and it, it's very predictable movie. She moves into uh, she well, she becomes uh, um. A healthcare provider for a, that takes place in the bayou in uh, Louisiana. She becomes a healthcare provider for someone who lives on an old uh, plantation, you know. So they had like uh, a, a bunch of slaves and whatnot. And uh, basically, she goes in to take care of this uh, old uh, man who can't talk. It's and he's and it's John Hurt, the actor John Hurt who okay. just got to phone in a performance because he doesn't have a single line throughout the entire movie. He's He has a stroke in the movie, so all he does is lie in bed and, and grunt and groan. So well, you, John, John Hurt. Hurt is not uh, the most emotional actor out there. To begin Make, with. Getting, getting that paycheck, you know, just when he's sitting there <laughs> doing that thing. Anyways, uh, there, there is a plot twist at the end of the movie. I guess I'm not going to spoil it just in case somebody might enjoy uh, the movie, but I found it very predictable. And uh, I bet know, you there's could... a lot of scenes of somebody opening up doors with a skeleton key, maybe peeking through the little uh, keyhole. You got it. You've you, you must have seen That's this the movie. movie. You must have seen this movie. Well, old, old stuff is creepy. 
old skeleton key what's behind the door they, they, does she move in early on and she tries to open the door it's locked and she's like oh i can't get in there I wonder what's inside let's peek inside the little keyhole see all the the curtains all the the the, the blankets over furniture and stuff are you sure you haven't seen this movie? Because <laughs> <laughs> you're you're very close. You're very close. Well, <laughs> Extremely close. Um, I will say though, you do get to see some Kate Hudson side boob. So if you're interested oh, in so this, you gave it an A, huh? That scene <laughs> is an A plus. Okay. The rest of the movie, not so much. Not so much. Okay. So here are the movies that I bought. I watched two of them, and the rest I haven't seen. So my, I, I finally got a D movie. I got the the Disturbia with Shia LaBeouf. Never watched okay. more Shia LaBeouf in my life. So this is kind of a rear window kind of th- yep. mm-hmm. take kind of thing. So I'll be talking about that soon. And then I got The Perfect Storm with Mr. Wahlberg and George Clooney, which I had never seen. And then, sorry, what was that one called? Perfect. What was that one called? Perfect Perfect story. Okay, yes. So that's my P movie. P. Okay. And then I needed a a Y, so I got the You, Me, and Dupree. I saw that in the store the other day. Yeah. And I I remembered you talking about that. I'm really not looking uh, forward to it. Three bucks, and I did not buy it. I, I paid about the same amount. Uh, if you I, uh, well, if you're willing to go outside of your uh, HD DVD selection, I did watch a Y movie uh, that was interesting. I, I'm not sure if you would like it, but uh, you might like it more than you, me, and Dupree. Well, the HD DVD is going to get me an extra point, so that's why I have to. Yeah, that's true. No, Unless I watch ahead. it on VHS. You're, you're doing a lot of for the points movies where you're not That's exactly right. enjoying the process. I, well, these last two movies, I am enjoying the process because these movies here, I, I already had them, you know, and I, it's like finally get to them. And are they any good? I, now I know, <laughs> you know, okay. uh, cause I bought them in a lot with movies that I really wanted, you know, and they just came with a lot. So mm-hmm. anyways, so I am enjoying the process because I am going through, the backlog you know so this whole thing is still still fun like even if i don't like a movie i'm still having fun for the most part okay now here's a fun movie that's not very good at all okay uh i'm gonna uh yeah i'm just gonna show it to you here we go we got the out for justice with the (laughs) steven seagal Uh, oh my goodness oh my goodness Oh my god. No, uh go, go ahead and remind me of the plot of that one because so, they're, they're all running together. So, this movie is directed by John Flynn. And John okay. Flynn's Is this the uh, one with Jerry Orbach? Yes. Okay. Correct. John Flynn he his ambition was to make a Goodfellas type of film. This is a movie uh, what oh, was the boy. original? T- Let me see if I can see the original. Hmm. I can find the original. Oh, the, the original title for the film was The Prince of Our Blood. Because the movie takes place in a part of Little Italy in New York. And uh, Stephen Scull is an Italian because he normally is Italian in the movies for some reason. Stephen Scull is whatever he needs to be for and, a role. And so he is related to a lot of the, like, these are the people from his town who grew up to become part of uh, organized crime and he grew up to be a cop, right? So he is conflicted yes, yes, yes. with, with uh, the whole thing and all that. And they wanted to have like more of that kind of story. And eventually the is, movie- Is his name, is his name Nico in that one? Uh, was his name Nico? Uh... Cause I, there's one of his movies that is known by as Nico in in other parts of the world i think that's the uh another one because his name in this movie was gino gino yeah he's gino you're thinking of Mm. the one with the church and all that uh Uh, above the law got the one maybe maybe it's above the law so (laughs) 
So uh, that was the 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 vision for for this uh, film. Um, unfortunately, they got Steven Seagal as the lead actor, and the movie studio went in and said, "You're not." They went in and shot a whole bunch of stuff, and the studio the studio looked at the dailies and said, "We're not doing that. You're cutting this down to ninety minutes, and we're just going to go with all the action, even if mm-hmm. the story doesn't make any sense. We're just going to go right to all <laughs> the action." Um. The story doesn't it, it it's 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 all over the place. It's unnecessarily complicated. And the most complicated thing I found about the film is that there are while there are a bunch of female actresses in the movie, they everybody, they all look alike because they all give them the same kind of hairstyle and they're all wearing mm-hmm. the same kind of clothes and it's really hard to figure out who the heck who is who. Is this the one with Sharon Stone? Sharon Stone is not in this film. No. Okay. So uh, they, so basically, there is uh, his partner, Steven Seagal's partner, is shot in the street by a uh, mobster, uh, played by William Forsythe, who actually does a fairly okay. good job in the film as a psychotic uh, mobster guy. And so then uh, Steven Seagal has to find out why he doesn't even care. He actually, this is the thing, like. The plot of the film is that he is trying to find who the uh, why his uh, partner was killed. It's supposed to be a bit of a mystery. He knows who killed him, but he wants to find out why he was killed. So that's the plot of the film. Unfortunately, Steven Seagal doesn't care about the plot. He just goes in and he's like, I want to kill that guy. I'm going to go kill that guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't even and, and people are trying to explain to him like what the other guy's motivation was to to kill his. And he's like, I don't care. I'm just going to go kill him. You know what I mean? And it's just it's like a really weird thing to watch your lead actor actually fight the plot. You know, like all the actors on set are trying to stick with the script. And he's just like, mm-hmm. I don't care. I'm just going to go kill that guy. You know, uh, and apparently like so. Okay, so there there are three like female act actors in the film, and it makes no sense why there are three of them because really, it it turns out that his partner was sleeping, was cheating on his wife, right? So you have the wife who knows that her husband's cheating, and she tries to hide it by hiding this this photo, right? And for some reason, he is trying to find out why the mobster is upset about him. Like, why does he care that this cop is cheating? Right. And so they, it's so complicated for no reason. So it turns out that the, the, the woman that he's cheating on was also, was the, this mob bosses, William Forsythe's uh, girlfriend. So that's why it was a, it was like a jealousy thing. Right. But the photo that she's holding for some reason, they in the movie wanted like a nude actress, like an actress nude in these photos, right? To show like these risque photos. So Sarah and I are watching this, and the woman in the photo that they keep showing has like these really big augmented breasts. If, mm-hmm. if shall we say, like they're just so fake looking, it just doesn't make any sense. So when he's confronting the wife, it's like, okay, well, the wife isn't the person in the film because her her breasts are too small. But then he finds this other woman and he starts like bringing her around and all that. And it's like, well, wait a minute. That actress is, uh, what's her name? Gina, wait, hold it. Gina Gershon, who is a Canadian actress. Mm-hmm. Like if, you, if you're in Canada, you know who Gina Gershon is. And it's like, she's too famous. She can't be in, in, in this. So that's not her. And then he, so then he finds another woman and you're like, okay, that's the girl, right? This is the one. But then he starts like moving her around. Like he's car- like, he's like bringing her to his car and that, and her boobs are moving all over the place. And it's like, well, that's not the one with the augmented breasts. So what is going on? There's like three, gr- like what is happening? And then, so finally, finally, towards the end of the movie, there is a fourth girl who he finds dead in a bed and she has the augmented breasts. And you're like, okay, that's the girl in the photo. And I'm like, why did we have to go? There's actually four. 
There's four women. If you yeah, if you count the wife, there's four women. So why do we have to go through all these steps? And I think I'm figuring it's because they wanted to have like these a photo of a nude girl, and each actress did, said, "I'm not going to pose nude in these photos." So they just kept adding <laughs> actresses into this story <laughs> until they finally found one that would say, "Yes, I will pose nude in these photos." And they were able to because it just doesn't make any sense why you would have to go from Gina Gershon to this waitress that's in the middle to finally get to like it, it just it was just unnecessarily complicated well you hooked but, rocket sauce what's the name of this movie again i guess it's that called out this movie a chance it's <laughs> called out for justice so i know i know i've seen this movie but none of what you're saying sounds familiar it's all, it's uh, all aside from aside from gina gershon because i do remember her being in one of these movies and then thinking Wow, she's in a Steven Seagal movie. Yeah, yeah. Same for for Sharon Stone and Keith David and Jerry Orbach and like. <laughs> well, and one I of the other he didn't the have other, the notoriety at the time. Uh, one of the other women in it is uh, Juliana Margulies from uh, ER. I think that she was in this one. Yeah, she's in this one too, playing an Italian too. Anyways, so I had to, I had to like, you know, I wanted to confirm this feeling that I had. You know, so I'm like, I bet you if I go to the production notes on Wikipedia, they'll say something about this and it'll confirm my feelings. Mm -hmm. I could, I, I went to the Wikipedia and unfortunately I didn't get that answer. But I, what I found was even better. <laughs> okay. What I found out was even better. So yeah, the movie was called uh, The Prince of Blood. Okay, so uh, the director, like he's just going on about how much he did not like working with Steven Seagal at all he uh he's like jerry orbach william Forsythe. they showed up on time they all had they were ready to go they had their lines going steven seagal apparently he would show up like an hour late to every shoot they were they they would try to explain to him that the character nico needs to be in peril you know or gino sorry needs to be in peril some at mm -hmm. some points in the movie you know to create dramatic tension and steven seagal would just refuse like he, yeah. he's like, you know, he has to be in control for every scene. You know, he has to, he can't show any sign of weakness or anything like that. Yeah. There are very few scenes in all of his films where he actually gets injured or, yeah. or takes any sort of uh, damage. Yeah. He's, um, he's, he's usually just, he wants to be the guy who's always on top. He's always cool. He's always uh, got the edge. Uh, apparently he made the director change a bunch of scenes because William Forsythe was kind of like out acting him, was stealing the show mm -hmm. kind of thing. So he was like, no, if, if we're going to cut all that stuff out. But here's the here's the how, best. How did he have this sort of influence that early in his career? Because this this movie, when it came out and was released, it was the number one box office. Like it was it shot up to number one. So, right. But but that's. After it came out during production, why were they listening to this guy who who had like very few well, credits? At because the time? of the movies prior to this, right? There was uh, Above the Law, Hard to Kill, and Mark for Death, which were three. Oh, hits, okay. So all three right? of those. Yeah. Right, so okay. he had he basically had all the say. You know, like no, this is the way okay. we're going to going to do it for the most part. And then and let's do it. so. But this was the best. This was the best piece of information. I I got to read this. I know it's not fun to hear someone read on a podcast, but trust me, this paragraph will be fun. So while on production set, Seagal possibly, now this is all, nobody nobody's cop to this, right? Nobody will cop to this 100%, but Seagal possibly claimed that due to his Aikido training, he was immune to being choked unconscious. At mm -hmm. some point, Gene LaBelle, who was the stunt coordinator for the movie, heard about this, uh, about this claim, and may have given Seagal the opportunity to prove it. He supposedly placed his arm around Seagal's neck, and once Seagal said go, choked him out to unconsciousness, urination, and defecation. <laughs> After I, refusing I think to, I have heard this story. After refusing to comment for years, LaBelle uh, circumspectly... I don't know why they put in words here I can't pronounce. Anyways, he uh, referred to the story at some point, this LaBelle guy, which mm -hmm. kind of confirmed the story, but he's never actually confirmed it. 
So Seagal is right. like, yeah, I got this training. You can't choke me out. <laughs> and so this guy choked him out to the point where Seagal shat and pissed himself. Yeah. I think that's great. Yeah, go, go to uh, YouTube. You can find so many fun Steven Seagal stories that yeah. are told by other people. I mean, uh, Rob Schneider's got a couple of them that are that are really good. That uh, uh, a lot of the people from SNL talk about. The yeah, time Steven Seagal hosted and how he was like the worst host. regarded as the worst host in history. I have seen some John of like, that. Yeah. John Leguizamo was constantly making fun of his running and how Steven Seagal basically like knocked the wind out of him to create like an alpha dog status on set. Right. Uh, everybody's got terrible, terrible stories of, of having to deal with him. Well, and that SNL, all these guys who are out there collecting uh, the VHS tapes and all that, apparently that uh, SNL episode of SNL has never re-aired the same way that it did mm. originally. So if you get a copy of that on VHS, uh, you know, that, that, that might be uh, gold for you. Because they have, oh, sure. you know, it has re-aired, but it's been edited or whatever, like the full right. thing. I don't know. That's what I've been told. Uh, prob Anyways. Probably the same, again, for you VHS collectors. The SNL monologue of uh, Martin Lawrence when he hosted. I, rem I remember I saw that when it happened. And then there was a big uh, backlash of how, you know, hosts aren't allowed to write their own intros anymore. Mm. Uh, he, he did a comedy routine. Uh, Martin Lawrence or Dave Chappelle? Mar Martin Lawrence. Okay. Uh, and it was all about how uh, when a man is with a woman, that woman should properly take care of her area. <laughs> okay. And, and that, you know, that, they, uh, that, that um, yeah, I'm sure that one hasn't replayed. Uh, that doesn't sound so bad to me. Uh, I don't know. It's just, it's the... just about hygiene. Yeah. I don't know. What's wrong with that? Well, I know that there was a big thing when Chappelle did his uh, opening monologue <clears throat> on SNL. I never heard of Martin Lawrence having a... a what? That one goes back a bit. Uh, I, I remember watching that with my uncle, and he he realized how bad this was going to be, and he he would keep flipping through the channels. Oh. Uh, and like, going back, he's <laughs> like, they're like, what are you doing? I want to watch Saturday Night Live. He's like, ah, I want to check something. You go back to it. He's still rambling. He's like, oh, switch around again. Oh, wow. <clears throat> All right. All right. So that's, I think that's enough. For so you. the highlight <laughs> is a Steven Seagal movie. <laughs> oh, no. It, oh, I mean, almost. Yeah. I mean, we did have fun watching it for all the wrong reasons kind of thing. Like there's one scene in yeah. the movie where he is chasing the bad guys down the street. And then for some reason, mm -hmm. Steven Seagal deeks over to another lane and it's underneath the uh, like the L train or something like that. And so the bad guys are driving down the street like this and he's driving down this L train in this Caprice and it's just like bouncing. Like it's the bumpiest road you've ever seen. <laughs> and he's just flying. And if he was actually in the car, he'd be like flying all over the place. But every time they show him, he's just mm -hmm. stiff as a board, like not moving at all, you know? I'm it's the control. it's the most bizarre car chase I have ever seen in a film. It is something else. Hmm. Okay, and finally, for my J movie was a cartoon, The Justice League, The New Frontier. Hmm. I promised I'd talk a little bit about Batman, and here it is. So uh, I watched this, and I was confused as ever, because every time I watch some of these comic book films, they just throw in hmm. characters and I have no idea what the hell is like, who's that guy? I don't know who that guy is. And they just, you know, anyways, it's kind of interesting. It's um, based on a, a graphic novel where they kind of bridge the gap between the post World War II DC universe and the silver age era of the DC universe. So okay, basically uh, as the United States uh, closes down their war with the Nazis and starts uh, the Cold War with the Iron Curtain, where is the uh, superheroes place in all this? Right. And mm -hmm. they're all coming like Wonder Woman and Superman. They're all coming to terms with the fact that they were very clearly on the good side uh with the world war ii and now things are kind of getting a little more 
nuanced, a little more complicated, mm -hmm. right? Because there are, you know, America isn't perfect. There are civil rights issues. There's all sorts of things that are wrong. And you can't just go in and be uh, a Boy Scout and, uh, you know, blindly follow what the government tells you because you got that whole thing with the McCarthy era and all that stuff. So it's a little more complicated. Um, and there's a lot of interesting uh, stuff in it, like Batman, for instance. It's like the old school Batman where he's wearing the, the black and gray uh, uniform. And uh, there's this uh, cult that is uh, about to sacrifice this small child. So Bat Batman goes in and just beats up all the cultists, right? Smacks them all around and all that. And meanwhile, a cop who is actually the Martian Manhunter in disguise uh, follows him in there as well. And uh, as uh, Batman beats up all the cultists and everything, he goes to rescue the child who's tied up to this post. And the kid is just as afraid of Batman as he is of all the cultists, right? Because Batman's in this, you know, he just looks scary to this little kid. Mm -hmm. So Martian Manhunter goes in disguised as a, as a police officer and tells Batman, hey, you got to back off because you're scaring the kid. And through that, that's where Batman decides to add Robin to his crew. And he changes his outfit from the black and gray to the blue and gray to make him a little more uh, presentable because he wanted to put the fear into criminals, but not into small children. So it's kind of it so he could sell another action figure. Well, I mean, in reality, it was because color was getting better <laughs> in the pages and they wanted to make right. things more and more colorful and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. and, but anyways, it was just kind of interesting how they kind of filled some gaps like that. Uh, but there was okay. a lot of confusing... there's, there's tons of those uh, DC animated films. Yeah, this was the second one that they that they did, and um, it it's you know it, it it was good, but there was a lot of gaps in it. Like there was characters that were popping up, like this one character, Adam Strange, and they don't actually explain who he is in the movie. He just shows up, and actually, I got most of the information I needed from the ten minute. They actually had like a the author, like a little 10 minute clip on the HD DVD, like an extra. And he kind of explained like all the stuff that they cut out from the film and like, oh, OK, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I ended up reading the graphic novel as well over the last couple of days. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, hmm. I could I can't really recommend the film of itself. Like it's only 75 minutes, but it just there's not enough there, I think, unless you're like a real comic book geek and you can fill in the gaps all, all by yourself but yeah yeah anyways i thought that was interesting uh take on on the batman and the whole thing was just kind of it's you know the space race is in there too and the green lantern and you know how he uh uh was like a, a test pilot you know and then he he mm -hmm. becomes a green lantern i don't know it was all right it's good times yeah so there you go. Speaking so of one, uh, superhero good. cartoons, yes, um, I did see th that. Um, I, I wasn't sure if this was out or, or whatever already, but that X Men cartoon is finally coming out. The X Men ninety seven. It's like a continuation of the X Men series from the nineties. Okay. Um, where they're they're trying to go for a retro feel to make it look and sound and feel. And they probably even have some of the original. Uh, Voice actors, creators, writers, maybe voice okay. actors. I don't know. But that's coming out. But uh, I, I'm curious now that this is if this is finally coming out. I've always been trying to find a copy of the the DVDs for the original run of that series. I have the first. There's like five different seasons, I think, and I have the first season on DVD. And I've always been trying to find the others, and they're always like out of print or really expensive, hard to find. Have they re-released that in any form? Is, is anybody out there listening to this aware? I'm not sure. I think, if I remember correctly, in Canada, we actually got more episodes than in the States, I think. Ooh. Because there were some Canadian releases. I remember, like, a few years ago. Like, keep out an eye out for those X-Men uh, DVDs. Only on DVD and VHS. Yeah, but I mean, like, if they're re-releasing this, I'm kind of hoping that they'll... I imagine they would. You know put this thing out again a little promotion because i i would love to sit down and watch through some of those i'm 
for some reason, I'm, I'm not really so yeah. interested in the the new one. There but, you go. Uh, They're all on Disney Plus. That, no, I don't want Disney Plus. There, I want what, physical media. That's that's where and they're going to tell you to go. With you. Disney Plus. I'm still waiting for that Beavis and Butthead movie to come out in some yeah. form. Like I, I thought, it. I thought I read somewhere that it was coming out on DVD, and every time I look, I, I can't find anything. Mm. I'm not subscribing to all these different services. Just put it out on a disc. I don't buy I, it. Well, I got myself uh, my Android box and my eye patch, and I just go to town that way because I am not. Oh, I think they're on the Plex too. Okay. Oh <laughs> well. Well, there you go, Josh. Right. You got you got the X Men on the Plex. Which is nice and appreciated, but I I would still like a physical copy. It's just but if you if you wanted to get yourself ready, <clears throat> you you can you can watch it. Yeah, I, I'm I don't think I'm going to be so interested in this new series. I, I don't think I could watch it. It's just uh, the, the older ones. You know, you could try to make things look retro and sound retro, and and but it's still going to not have the same vibe. Certain... It, it might you never know you never know sometimes know. sometimes it does happen you never know In, eh, well we'll see um I've, I've also been keeping up with the the challenge the movie challenge uh i did send you i don't know if you still use your buried on mars gmail but i did I send do. you a copy of my um my spreadsheet there oh i did because there's that. so many movies that i i can't choose what to talk about so if there's anything on there that you want me to comment on i have completed most of the challenge i'm seven oh. movies shy oh you just of, sent it uh, to me there we go i just sent it to you okay. while you were uh, explaining there um i'm still missing uh yeah seven letters i think um but i'm trying not to go outside of my physical media until i have to so there are still a number of things I need to watch because I, I want to get rid of my backlog. I want to watch everything that I haven't seen yet. Uh, and I still have a few to go, but I, I am going to have to buy like a J, a K, an L, something like that. So, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I, that's forever and a day trying to watch all my movies in the backlog. And then you end up buying more. And uh, just Yeah. Like, yeah. So I, I did buy two things. I bought a V. I had to finally watch Vegas Vacation, which was a very, very rough watch. I say we should get bonus points for watching bad movies because yeah. some of these are a little painful to sit through. Vegas Vacation is, yeah, I don't know. Coming on the heels of Christmas Vacation, written by John Hughes. You yeah, know, it was just. Oh, definitely. This felt, yeah, it's this fine. felt like so. It felt like they shot it and then reshot it because some scenes are so dumb and stupid and lack any sort of style. And then there's a couple scenes where it's like, oh, this is starting to feel like a movie again. This this looks a little bit better. And, and then, you know, things don't make sense. So it feels like it was a hodgepodge of just, oh, we're not doing that story anymore. Now let's let's try it this way. And yeah. But I guess that that's something that they brought back that wasn't uh, wasn't as good. Is that like seven years, right, between the the two movies? So, oh, Vegas Vacation was ninety seven. What year was yeah. Christmas Vacation? I was like, I think 90, it was eighty nine, ninety, like eighty nine. Christmas and, was eighty nine. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, true. Wow, all right, that was a while. What the heck is Yummy? Yummy is another movie that I bought um, specifically because I needed a why. And also because I was kind of interested, it's a Danish horror film. Uh, this is something I found in they were getting rid of in the, the rental shop. So I was able to buy a copy. Uh, it, it's a Danish horror film. I, I can't really say too much more without spoiling it. Uh, but you can tell they were somewhat going for like a Shaun of the Dead, mm. Evil Dead kind of comedy horror. Uh, I think it would have worked better if they didn't try to lean on the comedy at times. Uh, it's it's fine. It's not great, but there's some fun stuff in there. There there are a few moments that are comedy and that that work. Uh, they do go heavy on the gore, and it's a lot of uh, physical uh, makeup and practical effects. A little bit of uh, digital stuff in there too. The movie is. 
a Danish film, but it's I'd say it's like 85 to 90 percent in English. There's just a few moments where they you need some subtitles for the uh, for the Dutch. Um, I guess I guess uh, it, it takes place in a uh, plastic surgery uh, ward of the hospital. People go in for plastic surgery and then horror happens. Steven is upset. He missed the toys. Yes, oh, have to go I, back. I, look, look, here's a here's a Back to the Future toy. There you go. I talked uh, about these. I'll give you a taste of my toy here, Steven. There. That's, that's all you get. Oh, wow. That's it. I go back and listen. Um, I see you watched uh, the James Bond film Thunderball. I watched a couple of James Bond movies. I watched Thunderball. I watched Goldeneye. Okay. I watched For Your Eyes Only. Okay. And I got to say, Goldeneye was pretty fun. Yes. Goldeneye was it was pretty fun. Um, every James Bond movie I've seen has had fun moments. They've also... I, I, it's I okay. don't understand <laughs> how James Bond became such a huge franchise. Because typically, Hamp doesn't go over well with a lot of audiences. And I find so many of these movies are so campy at times. I, I just, I'm still having trouble getting in that vibe. I can see where the movies are, are well-made and there's a lot of fun stuff going on, but I'll be watching one of these movies and then it's like, it's fairly serious and takes itself, you know, like, okay, this is going to be a, a spy thriller. And then it kind of becomes more of like a spy comedy for like little spikes and then it gets a little serious again and then it gets pretty goofy and all the constant one-liners of every time there's a death bond has to like give some kind of goofy one-liner it just it they feel off balance to me i i can't quite connect with them yet they're not yeah. uh, always consistent, um, and then people have like their favorites, and <clears throat> they're not so favorites. Um, I'll, I'll be like Thunderball to me is uh, one of the it's it's the longest James Bond film, and it feels like the longest James Bond film is probably mm, I won't say it's my least favorite Sean Connery one, but it's mm -hmm. one that kind of it kind of drags a bit. Um, there's some good moments in it, but. Uh, there are good goes. moments in a lot of them, and and I have enjoyed uh, parts. And then you know you get to the scene where it it just feels like there's so much stuff that's obligatory. You have to put it in every James Bond movie. Like he has to be with at least two to three women. In, oh yeah, in every film. Oh yeah. Sarah uh, and I would like know. when we would watch it, <clears throat> we would like make a bet on how long it would take him to get laid. You know. Yeah, we would, we would do like the Price is Right thing. Like you can you can try to get as close as possible, but if you go over, <laughs> you're that's, out. Okay. That's it. So, like the the sixties, like we'll say Sean Connery, always within ten minutes. He was he was right within ten minutes. Mm -hmm. And then as Bond matures over the decades, it gets a little longer mm -hmm. and longer before he uh, beds a lady. Uh, I'll say Goldeneye is great. It's just a great action film. From beginning to Golden end. Eye was I fun. I really enjoyed the tank sequence. That mm -hmm. that was um, very well done. But yeah. even that one, it's at, at times it just it's taking itself fairly seriously. And then like the the hacker bits with like Alan Cumming, and he's so over the top. And I'm invincible. <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff. It's like, well, what is it? And then uh, you got uh, Jean Grey there, Famke Jensen, and yeah. she's. I had to ventilate somewhere. Yeah, uh, yeah. You yeah. know, the, it's like there's always those uh, things. The, yeah. yeah, right. So it's I, I, it's I don't have a problem with the movies. I just I really don't understand how they caught on so well because people, uh, angry people on the internet, especially, love to complain about how things get campy and silly. There was in movies, and they there wasn't that in the serious. 1960s though. That that's right. that's different. I, I you know? don't know. You have to kind of put yourself in the mind of when the movies came out and how they kind of gradually kind of changed and stuff like that. Like you watched, so you probably watched like a weaker Sean Connery one. You watched the well, best. I've seen. Oh, you uh, watched, oh you're going to say the best Pierce Brosnan. The best Pierce Bronson one because they kind of go downhill from 
there. That's like a steady. Now I was going to say the first Bond movie I saw was the um, the Halle Berry one, and you said that That's was like awful. one of the worst. I, it is, the and worst. I I'm going to say that I would probably enjoy that film a little bit more now that I've seen that it wasn't just that movie. It's the yeah, whole yeah. franchise dips into that territory. Yeah, Maybe well, that it's was not the best example, but that at was least part it's of your. Still having the same i the same ideas of like it's campy it's silly it's goofy one-liners constantly going to another location yeah it, it like in the the one that got me is uh for your eyes only was the the most recent one i watched and like halfway through the film i, I realized like i have no idea what's going on here <laughs> like who are they after they went after this guy they killed him they went after this guy they killed him does who, jump who around are they after yeah and then uh, finally I realized, oh, it's that submarine from the beginning. It's mm -hmm. like, and you have to go to the scene where he's at a casino playing cards and, you know, he got a little bit of information. Now they're somewhere else. It's, it's constantly jumping around. They, they make a big deal out of he goes to the card table and he wins a hand. He just walked up and grabbed two cards. It's like, <laughs> it's not like there's even any strategy. It's just luck. I don't know. Yeah, for your eyes only was is um I did a, read a little on that after I watched it and they said that one came out after Moonraker. Yes. And people were saying, oh, Moonraker was like so over the top it, goofy yeah. and, yeah. and tech wise that this one was played down. Yeah. You know, they didn't have they had the Q scenes, but he didn't give them any gadgets or anything. He wasn't going over cars and and, and wristwatches and pens yeah. and things like that. And, and honestly, I really enjoy For Your Eyes Only. I think that's one of the better uh, Roger Moore yeah. ones because of that, because it's a little like they, they try to make they try to see this is the thing with James Bond. They always kind of have mm -hmm. to reboot the character like it, it's he starts yeah. off seriously. Like you watch Dr. No, there's silly stuff in it. But for the most part, you know, it's a campy uh, spy thriller that James Bond himself kind of takes seriously and then as the films go on and on and on they kind of get more and more goofy and then they kind of have to reboot things right and the same yeah. thing with roger moore they kind of they actually kind of were not going to use roger moore again after moonraker but they couldn't find anyone else so they ended up signing him for four more movies and they rebooted the character again uh the the golden eye is a reboot movie right it's yeah. like okay let's bring pierce Bronson well every in. time you get a new actor you you get a different take on it, and I'm sure yeah. they change the tone a bit. I still yeah. haven't seen any of the um, uh, what's his name, Dalton. I haven't seen any of his yet. I do have one, and I hear that they're they're not the um, the favorites. But I also heard that his version of Bond is a little bit more serious, maybe a little darker. I I found him to be too stiff. <clears throat> I, I think I think he was just too like it wasn't smooth. He just was too stiff. Okay. And and the first movie that he does is it's a little bit okay, but the second one, they just it, it was kind of like the Star Trek thing where they set a budget in for for your eyes only in 1981. Mm -hmm. And then the next movie comes out, same budget, you know, but everything's got more mm -hmm. expensive. Next movie comes out, same budget, but everything's got more expensive, you know. So by 1988. Right. They're using the same. They're using a 1981 budget, and it feels like Shows. made for TV. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Hmm. Anyways, hey, I don't uh, know. I try to go into them just thinking, like, okay, I know the base formula now, and just think of it as a kid playing with toys. You know, it's just spy it's, adventure movie. Yeah. And still, it's like I can't stay focused in these films. I'm always taken out of it. Before I, I your eyes only one. The big thing for me there was the the lead actress who just couldn't open her mouth and every line of dialogue is just like this. <laughs> James, we've got to do something. Oh my! <laughs> I don't know. The don't acting know. from the female leads is varies, <laughs> varies from movie to movie. I was going to assume that that was not like a seasoned actress, and maybe she might have been hired for her looks. Might have been, possibly. Have been. <clears throat> okay. Um, what you did we talk about? Get Shorty. <clears throat> no, but uh, that was good. I enjoyed it. I love that movie. That's that's one of my mm. 
one of my favorites. So there's a sequel to that, right? The the be cool. Yeah, avoid that one at all costs. It, oh, okay. Yeah, it's not very good. My my biggest problem with be cool is I I they're based on Elmore Leonard novels, and I read be cool. And as I'm reading be cool, it's about Chili Palmer getting into the music business, right? He's kind of given up mm -hmm. on the movie business. He's getting into music, and the band that he has discovered. Uh, Elmore Leonard describes this band as ACDC with twang. They're like an ACDC type of hard rock band, but they got a little bit of country twang into them. So when the movie was announced, I'm like, I can't wait to hear that. I want to hear what that sounds like. I'm, you know, I really want, want that experience. And then the movie comes out and of course they change it for the movie. to some, you know, R and B modern R&B singer like she's from uh, uh American Idol or something like that. Yeah, it's disappointing. But the movie itself uh, well is, that it, if the movie yeah. itself is no good that that's more you went in with a certain expectation yes. that the movie went in a different direction. Yeah. That that can be okay. It's just uh if the movie's no good. I don't know. What would you mm -hmm. think of uh Aaron Brockovich? Oh, she's not a nice person. No, I didn't you're like right, her. You're right on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know it's based on a real person, and mm -hmm. you know that's probably her personality. Um, it, it it's a um, it's a it's a studio executive movie. It's one of those movies where it's well made, story's fine, characters good, performances all that. It's it's great. I'm sure studio will be very proud of it. It'll make a lot of money. It's just not a movie that stays with me. Mm. Like it, it's, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not in any rush to go rewatch it. Um, but it's, it's a fine movie if you're into that sort of just human drama. If I'm gonna help people, something. Yeah. The the big the uh, funniest part of the movie to me was uh, at the end when she gets a check. And Julie Roberts has to pretend that $2 million is a lot of money <laughs> considering she got paid $20 million to make this movie. Oh, wow. Well, maybe she is a good actress then. Wow. Oh. Maybe. That always gets me in movies when you have these big A-list celebrities and they're talking about, oh, we're going to win like $500,000 here. And like, mm -hmm. Come on. I, you wouldn't even show up to set $500,000. <laughs> uh. Hail Caesar. What is that? The that's a Coen Brothers movie. That was Coen good. Brothers. Yeah, I watched a couple of Coen Brothers movies. Hail Caesar, True Grit. That was also good. Right. Um. Gosh, was there anything else in there? Hail Caesar. Tons and tons and tons of cameos. Lots of actors and actresses who just like they'll show up for one or two scenes. In fact, um, half the people uh, promoted on, on the poster only have like one or two scenes like oh, yeah. uh, Jonah Hill is in it for like, I think he has like two or three lines. Scarlett Johansson has a couple of scenes, but she's really not a major player. Um, Wayne Knight is in it uh, right away. Um, there's, there's so many people. <clears throat> well, yeah, I do want to see it. I've, I've never seen it. There's, so many movies here I want to talk to you about, but you you won't even see him in the movie. But apparently, Dolph Lundgren, oh yeah, in the film, oh. <laughs> he like you you can't even tell it's him. And he supposedly had a another scene that was cut. Uh, but you know he he was just so excited. Like the Coen Brothers want me in their movie. Uh, okay, this is the final final one. Mm. Okay, Sugarland Express. The, Ste the Steven good. Spielberg, 1970s. Was it Goldie Hawn? That was good. Yeah, Goldie Hawn. I, I do like Goldie Hawn. Uh, uh, it's, I, I forgot. You know, I'm always... Sometimes I would wonder, like, how come I don't see Goldie Hawn anymore? She's a little older than I than I think she is. You know? e she, yeah. She, yeah. she kind of... 70s and 80s was, was really her, her time. 60s, um, really. Like, late 60s. <laughs> hmm. She, she, uh, she was on um remember she was on uh laughing right she, wasn't she one of the laughing girls oh i don't know okay. <laughs> that's a little before my time wow yes sugarland express was good uh you had um uh walter peck in there that's he, right he was good as uh as her uh boyfriend there uh the little country accents 
kind of got a little tiring at, at times, but um, it, it was just a, a fun little uh, caper. I, I I believe this was also based on a true story. So the the end title, like the end uh, little summary you get of what happens in the end, I, I found a little bit unbelievable based on what happened during the film. Mm. Because she, I, the whole thing is, she wants to get custody of her child. She right. had some trouble. Her husband, I, I forget if they were married. He had trouble, so they had their their child was. Uh, she gave custody away. Somebody mm. else got. Um, oh, what was the kid's name? They keep saying it. Little uh, Brant oh, Branford or something. I don't know. They keep saying his name. He had a very unique name. But uh, spoiler: in the end, uh, she gets custody. After they kidnap a cop and you know, shoot at police and everything, Langston, yeah, baby Langston, baby Langston, yeah, oh, a good good character movie. Just watching these people go through an ordeal and uh, great scenes of them uh, filling up at the gas station and having the whole convoy of police cars, you know, following yeah. them down the road. Yeah, hmm. I'm trying to remember what film it was that. Uh, the movie studio wanted Steven Spielberg to do a sequel of, and he was like, "No, nah, I'm going to do Sugar Land Express instead. I want to do mm -hmm. that." And they're like, "No, you got to do this." And there he's like, "No, I'm going to do what like did he, he did before he, that." Jaws. It wasn't one of his movies. It was like someone else's movie, and the oh, okay. they wanted him to do a sequel, okay. and he was like, "No, I'm going to like he he passed on on a boatload of money, probably uh, uh, about uh, an obscene amount that." julia roberts would laugh at because you know she's made so much more but uh mm -hmm. it was it was something like you know he could have made a lot more money doing a sequel to a film but he he wanted to do this movie instead some some great shots in there um apparently he was the first this was the first film to have this one particular shot where uh the camera operator is in the back of their car oh the, right there's a police car that pulls along one side and then they're on the CB talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And then, the, you know, the car pulls out in front and the camera's panning around and watching. And then it comes out on the other side. It's a really great shot. Yeah. Very creative. Yeah. They, um, there's so many, like, you know, stuff from television that I grew up watching, like the A-Team and uh, Dukes of Hazard and Knight Rider. Just like the style uh, uh, and camera work and all that, that, you know, were derived from these those early 70s movies like you know just how they would do their shots and have the cars coming through and all that like you could just see how the how television adapted a lot of that style mm -hmm. into their shows and uh, you know started with the 70s stuff mm -hmm. but yeah good stuff good names yeah clovis clovis Eugene oh, yeah. and clovis yeah no that's a fun movie i like that one i like that one and uh dirty mary Crazy Larry, that's another kind of... I, uh, I've seen that uh, DVD in the shop. I've never uh, picked oh, that's it a up, fun but that, that, that title really sticks out. Yeah, that, that's a fun one, too. You know, it's, it's it, If you like Sugar Land Express, that's kind of in its wheelhouse. It's not quite as sophisticated as this movie, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's a, a good, uh, little more action-y kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one other that I'll, I'll I'll point out that was on my list that I really really enjoyed was um, a simple plan. Oh, that was I a fantastic that movie. snowball movie. Yeah, that's a Sam Raimi cool. film. Sam Raimi, yeah, very un Sam Raimi like, except for one particular scene, which involves a shotgun. Mm. Uh, there, there was some great uh, wire work there, uh, but uh, really great story. Just the whole. Here's the, the one little thing. And then, uh, well, we're going to do this. There's a problem. Oh, there's another problem. Yeah. Oh, there's a bigger problem. It just keeps and snowballing. It just gets right. worse Snowball. and worse okay. and worse. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, it's based on one of my favorite books uh, called A Simple Plan, written by Scott Smith. Uh, go on my Goodreads. You can see it right there. It's on my favorites uh, list. The book is fantastic, too. And uh, it, that's one of those films that really captured. Uh, the novel, you know, just that whole uh, darkness of it. It's kind of it's kind of has a Coen Brothers feel to it too, like Fargo or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I was getting a lot of Fargo <laughs> vibes from yeah. that. In fact, I, I I was kind of 
I guess I misread it or, or misremembered things. I assumed that the, the Coen brothers wrote that movie. No. Uh, but no, they had nothing to do with it. But yeah, well, they might have they might have uh, did the screen adaptation, but it is. Uh, I don't think it. so. I, I was looking. I, okay. I didn't see their names pop up. Yeah. Unless I'm misremembering even yeah. more. And then Scott Smith, he only he's only done that book. And then he did another one called The Ruins. And it's about mm -hmm. these teenagers that uh, go into a cave and there's ruins in there and there's man eating plants. And I don't know. I thought it was I thought it was so bad. It's <laughs> so terrible. They made a movie out of it, too. I thought the movie was bad. I hate hated everything about it. Sarah kept the book. She liked it. I don't know to me, but a simple plan is just one of those uh, like it's almost like a 70s throwback too, like with the. You know, just true crime kind of thing. You know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Not true, but and um, completely different movies. But uh, you asked me about Aaron Brockovich and The Simple Plan. A Simple Plan is the kind of movie that stays with me, mm. and I'm like so excited to go watch that again. Aaron Brockovich is also a good, well-made movie, but it just, I don't know, it just doesn't. Uh, like some movies stay with you, and some movies don't. Yeah, I think well, like Aaron Brockovich is. I think it's a kind of a chick flick. It's more about the woman power, like women taking. Well, it power is over... played very heavily on that. It's it's very hit the head on the nail, uh, hit the nail on the head of just like if you have a feminist movie, the the villain has to be like a man, and that's usually when it yeah. kind of she's always <laughs> butting heads. But I think they did a good job in that. I wouldn't say it's really like a a feminist film, but she does butt heads with her boss quite a bit. And to his credit, he fights her back. You know, it's not like he's the evil man who's always wrong. He's still a bit of a pushover, though, like the her attitude and stuff like that. Like he kind of let times, a lot of yes. that slide. Like, you know, that secretary of his, if she was going around with that kind of attitude, he wouldn't put up with that. It's more because and, you know, like I watched a little bit of the extras on the uh, HD DVD and uh, I saw mm -hmm. an interview with the real uh, guy and uh I could kind of tell he's got a thing for Aaron, the real Aaron Brockovich. That's why he put up with with her and all her. Oh, uh, okay. I, I that's the vibe I got. Didn't, I didn't got make that. it into the. Uh, no, no, no. Obviously, no, no, no. But like, you watch an interview with him, and he starts talking about her, and his, you know, his whole demeanor kind of brightens up. It's like, oh yeah, he's got a thing for her, mm -hmm. but he can't act on it because he's married, and she probably wouldn't respond well to it and whatever anyways the, aaron brockovich not a bad movie but yeah it's not one that i wouldn't really care to watch again not a bad movie but one thing that got me um with that film is it it does suffer from one thing that it, it takes me out of movies a lot now is when other characters are wrong just so the protagonist can be right yeah it happens a lot and you see it coming when uh, they, they hand the case over to like yep. a bigger law firm. Well, exactly. What and you're then, doing. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like, okay, well, since you don't have any professional legal training, we'll take over from here. And then you got all the scenes of them not knowing how to communicate with the people and they only want to talk to her. And it's, it's the same thing as like in die hard when the, the, uh, the guy mm. out front is like, we're going to do this. And John McClane and, and uh, officer Winslow are, are saying like, no, we should do it this way. It makes sense. No, no, no. We're going to do it my way. And then everyone like they make stupid decisions and do everything wrong just so you can have the scene where the hero's right. And right. I'd rather have some more intelligent characters that can say, look, I see your point and I see our point. But we can, we have to do one, and yeah. logically, it does make sense to do this. Okay, let's try it that way. Oh, it didn't work. Now yeah. let's try it your way because that is also a good idea. Yeah, like yeah, the part know. that that annoyed me the most in Aaron Brockovich is when she has. So the case is is going to be a massive. Uh, what do they call it? A mass lawsuit or something like that? It goes. It's going to be bigger than just a couple of people suing. Uh, the company right they're going to be I, I can't think of the term anyways but i'm sure there is a term it's a really good term it, it probably is anyways they're going to go they're, they're doing a mass lawsuit and uh, uh so it you know they're bringing in other people to bring in a bigger firm to help them out right and uh you know the her Aaron brockovich's lawyer friend that she works for you know brings her into the room with the the new team 
And, uh, you know, one lady on the new team is like, hey, you've done some great stuff here. This is this all looks good. But, you know, we're going to take it over and we're going to fill in a little bit of the gaps that that were missed here. And she's like, Aaron Brock is like, what gaps? And she's like, well, you know, there's some things like there's we need some more information in here. Like you did great. This is everything's good in here. But there's some things that, you know, we just want to fill in. She's like, oh, there's nothing missing in that. Everything. Everything is, is oh, fine in that. Right. And yeah, the lady's yeah. like. Well, look, look, you don't have training in here. We know what to look for. She's like, no, no, everything's good in there. And she's like, well, Aaron, you don't have any of the phone numbers in here. How are we going to contact mm, them? Yeah. People? And right. then Aaron Brockovich just like, well, give me a name. And she just starts like rhyming off all the numbers. Yeah, that, that was like, annoying. How is that woman supposed to know that you have all the numbers memorized? That's just so stupid. Yeah. It annoyed me so much. And I just wanted to go in. Well, that, that, I mean, just the, punch her in the, the nose. supernatural ability. And again, maybe this was based on something that actually happened. I don't know. Sure. But it's just but the, the fact that way, she's just like encyclopedia. Like, yeah. Right. Like, I, no, I actually have all the numbers memorized here. We, like, you know, like, come on. Like, just snotty. You know, like, and I don't know how yeah. that is endearing to people. That love Aaron Brock. Well, you don't always have to have a likable character. No, in the in the main role, you know it. it, it no, is but she possible. wasn't. She it's not portrayed as like a, a Basil Fawlty or you know like or a Larry David or something like that, where you know the lovable curmudgeon or something like that. Mm -hmm. She it's just outright snotty and rude to that to that lady, you know, for just no reason. It's not like as if the lady did something to and like she just assumed that well because of the way i'm dressed and because of your preconceived notions that i don't have any you just assume that i missed all this stuff but i really didn't miss all this stuff and it's like well yeah. it wasn't in your notes you didn't put in the notes i have all the numbers memorized don't worry about it like you know i i don't know it just came off as really obnoxious yeah well, and it also just as as uh as a viewer, when you know exactly where the scene is going, it loses some of its interest. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just like at the end when boss comes in with her check, she's on the phone yeah, that, and yeah. she's like, yeah, don't bother me. I'm on the, yeah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah. well, yeah. I wanted to give your check, but it's different than uh, what we discussed. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. She goes off on and a he's tirade. With the and smirk and... Angry. Yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. like, of course it's going to be more. Yeah. And then she, She's finally nice when she yeah. gets a lot of money. She says, thank you. But uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but anyways, there you go. There's the, we broke down Aaron Brockovich to its bare essentials. Did not, you better did change not see the title that. of this episode. I, I guess so. Toys in the attic. Who's Toys was click like on that. Aaron was like about that much. That was a half hour discussion. You had to, <laughs> we had to break it down. We could have done a whole film dango on Aaron Brockovich. Hey, we would have annoyed idea. Sarah. Oh, you watch Fierce Creatures too? Okay, I can't ask you about that. That's too much. We we've been. I I know you said you didn't like it. You liked it uh, so much. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Oh my god! Well, maybe I need to rewatch it. Maybe it you know, may I... not. It. I don't think it's as polished as as a fish called Wanda, but um, for. For what it is, it I found it very entertaining. I, I thought there was a lot of clever stuff going on. I, I thought the performances were good. Uh, I enjoyed just this kind of odd concept. There was some great comedy about the whole concept of um, uh, of having dangerous animals uh, in the zoo and everything the zookeepers were doing to try to convince John Cleese's character that uh, their animals were dangerous. And well, it maybe, moved at a great pace right at the beginning. Yeah. I, I haven't seen it since it was in the theater. I watched it once in the theater. And I, I, I remember like Kevin Klein playing three different roles and like none of them were as good at as least. Otto. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, what? well, you know, you may always have that peak in your career, but that doesn't mean your other work is bad. No, I, I just, I felt like as if, I don't know, I, maybe I need to, to rewatch it. It's just, I think it was, it was a fine movie. All right. All right, you convinced me. I'll give it a rewatch. All right, that's Although it. We got what, we have what, to wrap. What up. did bother me though is oh. the title of the film is Fierce Creatures, but throughout yeah. the film they keep saying fierce animals. And I wasn't sure if that was a little change. Sorry, Sarah. Uh, a little change <laughs> for marketing or if it is the clever, you know, fierce creatures referring to the referring to the fierce humans in the in the film. So 
Maybe, yeah, maybe, oh, okay. sure. all right. Yeah. Okay, we have to wrap this up now. Uh, thank you, everyone Still in the right. comments, uh, Rocket Sauce, uh, Steven, uh, Deke, and Sarah came in at the end to say that she's going to eat without me if I don't mm -hmm. get off here right now. So, You're in trouble. Uh, that's it. Oh I, my we, goodness, we went two hours. She's so hungry. I know, we, I know, <laughs> but you. You dropped this like list of movies, and I want to ask you about every single one of them. But uh, well, you you may keep access, and then uh, if you see anything, you can yeah. have yourself prepared in the future. All right, we'll I'm sorry, Sarah. Nah, she's all she's all right. Kevin, Kevin right. stayed out past his curfew. <laughs> yeah, the streetlights are on, Richard. I gotta go home. <laughs> That's a Gen X reference for you all out there. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.